Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Oak Norton, and I am joined today by Julie Beeling. And Julie is an interesting person. She has written a book called Beneath Sheep's Clothing. And for those of you that are familiar kind of with that phrase, uh, you know, the hiding uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, um, her book kind of exposes some of the things that are lurking beneath the sheep's clothing in our society. And so welcome, Julie. Thanks for uh, joining me for this interview. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So Julie, let's talk uh, first a little about your background so that people understand who you are. Like, where did you grow up and what what did you uh, enjoy doing as a kid? Oh, I mean, I grew up with my dad in the Air Force, actually. So we lived, we moved about every three years on average. So Texas, Utah, Florida, California, New Mexico, Illinois. And then um, I went to college. Well, then I, I went to college in Florida and then uh, studied biology. Then I went on a mission to Russia in the late 90s, uh, Russia Samara mission. And I came back from my mission and got a dual master's in Russian language and literature and Russian and East European studies from Florida State. And during my um, graduate career, I wrote my master's thesis on underground Christian movements in the Soviet Union um, and their survival tactics and the tactics of the Soviet state to try to stamp them out. And then I realized I forgot to, what did I enjoy doing growing up? I was in band, I was a band geek and um, pretty pretty mainstream. Sure. Upbringing. So. So, so, okay, let's just backtrack one step. As, sure. a, as a teenager, what did you know about Russia? Because like um, when I was a kid, uh, Russia at that time, you know, the 80s, uh, I was born in 69. And so um, my my dad was also a military veteran and had spent 24 years in the military, Army and Air Force. And I grew up, you know, with this mindset that Russia was like, you know, the big enemy. And as I got later into my teen years, I, I kept having this feeling that maybe I would go on a mission to Russia. And my dad thought that was crazy. Like, you know, we would never, you know, we're not going to have missionaries in Russia for, you know, decades or whatever. And I didn't go to uh, Russia on my mission. I went to Houston, Texas, but it was shortly after my mission that we started getting missionaries in Russia. It was like almost immediately after because the Berlin Wall came down while I was on my mission. Yeah. And I remember passing a newsstand one day and I saw a Berlin Wall comes down. I, I was so detached from things. And I was just like, I stood there looking at the newspaper like, whoa, I don't have a clue what's going on in the world right now. But that was kind of exciting to see. So what was what was your sort of upbringing with Russia before your mission? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have I'm the youngest of four kids and my one of my older brothers um, who a little bit older than you in high school took Russian, Russian language. And so we had a dog, we got a dog and the dog was named Sabaka, which is dog in Russian. And so that was kind of my introduction to Russia. I, that, that, I didn't learn anything about communism, you know, in school growing up. And my brother actually wanted to go on a mission to Russia as well. He ended up going to Michigan instead, um, which I think is almost as cold. <laughs> and um, then I went, when I got to college, I, I had to take a foreign language. Uh, I was studying biology. I had to take two years of a foreign language. I was planning on registering for Spanish, like I took Spanish in high school. And then I actually had a dream the night before I was to register for classes. And in my dream, I was, there were, um, this guy from my ward was speaking Russian. And his dad was in my dream speaking Russian. His dad actually was a mission president in Moscow at that time. He was, and I had to been the head of the Russian department at Florida State. And in my in that dream, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to speak Russian. I just want to speak it. And I woke up and I was like, oh, I guess I'll register for Russian then. And so I took um, the two years of Russian and then graduated. And a few months later, went on. The, I was called to serve in Russia. Um, and yeah, it was it was amazing. Wow. So it's also very difficult, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's that's really fascinating. So uh, I also didn't know much about communism, how it worked or anything as a kid. 
in, in my schooling, we never really studied the Constitution, you know, in public school. And I, I was like 30 before I really thought, you know, I, I've always believed the Constitution was inspired by God, but like uh, I've never read it and studied it. And I thought, I need to start doing this. And I had some things happen that kind of inspired me that way. And it really helped set the stage for everything I've done in education issues the last 18 or so years. So what what was it like you went on your mission to Russia? Let's let's talk about a couple of things like did you how, how did the people of Russia influence what you would later do? Like, did you meet the underground Christian movement there? And what was that like? Yeah. So um, one of the things that, well, I found the, the people of Russia, they're very interesting people, Russians. Um, I found that they have this cold, crusty exterior. You don't smile at strangers. But once you get into an inner circle, become a close a friend with Russian, they will give you the coat off their back. They will give you their last food. They have just this generosity of spirit that I had never experienced before. And in terms of faith, well, the, one of the most shocking things for me as a missionary that I, I mean, I estimate that I talked to roughly a thousand people. We, we did a lot of short, like 15 minute first discussions and only one person out of everyone I taught said that they were an atheist, that they didn't believe in God. Hmm. Everyone else either said they believed in God or that they were open to believing in God and they were curious. And then there were a few people, just a few people I met that were well, there's this one family in particular in the city of Saratov, and it was um, they were Seventh Day Adventists, and they invited us in. And we usually would go in, and I, I talk about this story in my book. We usually would go in and teach people how to pray, but we were in their apartment, and their grandmother was there, and she taught all of us how to pray. It was like the most powerful prayer I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, okay, obviously this woman didn't just like this woman has been. This is like a long term thing. This family has been faithful throughout the Soviet rule. And there were some other things that I came across. Um, I actually, there was this myth that was reinforced by some things that we came across that there was some underground Mormons in the Soviet Union that that would like meet in the in like undercover and that they had, you know, they're very secretive. And some people actually from my mission met some of them. And they had their own, you know, they were all white for funerals and they lived like the law of consecration. I don't even know how real that is, but we met a man who said that there was a Mormon cemetery in this one city just outside of our mission. And we told the mission president about it. He actually drew us a map. Huh. I, don't, I don't know if any of that's true. Well, but... I, I'll tell you one thing that's kind of funny that you bring that up. Um, in school, I was the worst history student. I, my social studies classes, I had like zero interest in them. And I remember in a world cultures class, I think, I guess, 10th grade, ninth or 10th grade, whichever year it was. Um, I remember the, the teacher was showing this film to the class and it was like about Russian culture and stuff. And they were interviewing people in Russia. And I'm probably, you know, sitting on my desk, falling asleep with my head in my hand. And all of a sudden they, they asked this Russian person, what do you believe? And it, I, I can I can tell you exactly what that person said because it was the first article of faith from the, the church beliefs, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He, he said, well, I believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. And when he said that, I remember snapping my head up like, what? How would, how would he know to say that exact phrase? It was an exact quote, except he used I instead of we at the beginning, quoting... Wow. That first article of faith. So that, that may have been partly what influenced me toward thinking that like maybe Russia is, you know, things are being prepared there or something. Anyway, um, you well, mentioned there, is, there, there, there were there were some early converts to the church in St. Petersburg, Russia, Tsarist Russia mm -hmm. before the Soviet Union. And they were not heard from once the Russian Revolution happened. And so it is possible. And some people have said it's possible that they did you know, have like a small group of people that they were then teaching hmm. and who knows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So <clears throat> we can talk more about that, but like what, um, what about now you, you, 
you come back from your mission and uh, it sounds like you've already finished school by this point. I finished my undergrad, yeah. Before undergrad. My okay, so then you go back for your grad de graduate degree and mm -hmm. you decide to write a master's thesis on the, the underground Christian churches in Russia. In the Soviet Union, yeah. In the Soviet Union, okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. And so uh, what what led you to do that? Like what kind of pointed you in that direction? Well, you know, I didn't even have to write a thesis. Um, I there were a lot of signs. I'm kind of I'm kind of a person. I'm, I I get a lot of inspiration. I kind of go on inspiration a lot and I felt I felt led to do it. And I had a lot of things that just confirmed it. And then I took a, in my graduate program, I took a sociology class. And then for my pro, my research project for that sociology class, I did like a preliminary study on underground Christian movements in the Soviet Union. And that was to give me kind of like to figure out what exactly, which angle I would take for my thesis. And it went well and I had the angle and I could see that the sources that I would need were available. And so I just went ahead and did it. And oh, then... The next thing I'll, I'll just say, I, when I very first began, I mean, it just, it was very difficult, but again, there were like signs that would happen. I was able to go on a study abroad with Florida State um, to Moscow State, State University for two months. This is in um, the year 2000, actually. And it's, I was able to meet some, you know, Russian Baptists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and then just one instance, one of the churches I was researching for my thesis was this very specific sect of Pentecostalism. And so the group I was with, the students from Florida State, we, were, we had tickets to the Bolshoi Theater. My ticket, my seat was somehow separate from everyone else's. I started talking to the Russian guy next to me, and it turns out he was a member of that underground Pentecostal church that I was researching. And he invited me to go to his service. I went to the service, which was pretty wild. And then they gave me like a lot of their historical works, their own books that they had published about their own history. And I was able to translate um, that content and use it for my thesis. And so there was just a lot of signs that it was the right thing. And I did, I, I will say, I did have a feeling from the beginning that somehow there was some information about how the Christians in the Soviet Union got through and and not just survived, but some of them did quite well. I felt like there was going to be some clues there that would apply to America's Christians at some future date. Hmm. So. so at what point, okay, so you, you've, you write your thesis, and at what point then do you start to identify the communist influence? And, and how, do you, how did that like sort of come into your life? And, and yeah. uh, you kind of latched onto those concepts. Yeah. So after I wrote my thesis, I, I saved all of my materials and, and I put them away and I was like, well, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. And it was in 2000. So I defended my thesis in 2004, graduated in 2004, 2008. There was um, a big thing that happened in the news that um, you probably remember. There was a very unpopular fringe religious sect that were in Texas and the government showed up at their doorstep with tanks and came in and they did not have a search warrant. They took, seized a bunch of their materials and then they took all their kids and there was no due process. And no one likes this re small religious, unpopular religious sect. They're considered a cult, just like the Pentecostals and Baptists in the Soviet Union were considered members of cults. And so no one cared when their kids were taken from them with no due process. This, group of course was the FLDS and that was like that put alarm bells in my head because that was one of the things the Soviets did to the underground to the Christians um to specifically the fringe Christians in the in the early in the early part of the Soviet Union they repressed all Christians um especially the Russian Orthodox they executed they enslaved or put them in the gulag Christians especially clergy just left and right it was a bloodbath essentially but what they found, the communists found that it, that was not the most effective tactic, that it backfired. And so after World War II, they changed the Soviets, the communists changed their tactics and they only kept that set of severe repression for the Christians operating on the fringes. The mainstream Christians, they had another tactic to control them. But the, the fringe Christians, they were the ones that were still getting 
you know, arrested, their meetings were being raided, their kids would be taken and put in state care. So when I saw this happen with the FLDS w- without due process, um, even the ACLU was against it um, and spoke out about it. Uh, yeah, that, that really piqued my interest and I looked further and I found, so for my thesis, I focused on the three main anti-religious tactics that the Soviets used from post-World War II up until perestroika before the Soviet Union collapsed. And those three tactics were one, anti-religious propaganda and pro-communist propaganda in all aspects of society, schools, media, you know, you name it. Number two, repression and oppression of just the fringe Christian movements, heavy repression, you know, brutal, the torture, you know, enslavement in the gulag, the full nine yards. And then the third tactic was infiltration of the churches, um, the mainstream churches in particular. Um, they actually literally sent KGB agents into the into the seminaries, then to go in and pretend they were clergy to control the churches from within and water down their doctrines and make it more palatable to communism. So I, I started researching those all those other tactics happening if, to see if they were in place in America, and I very quickly found that they were, and. So then I began working on my book, 2009, 2010, 2011. Wow. So, okay. (laughs) What you, what you bring up is like really interesting about the three tactics. And, um, I'm I'm wondering like how, how many different examples, and I don't know if you've done this, this level of research, because there's a couple of big obvious ones. But like, how many times has this happened in America where a, a small group has been just essentially overrun by the government without mm-hmm. due process? Yeah, well, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas in 93 are, are the biggest example and the most obvious and horrific example. They're actually, um, from some research that I found, it's somewhere around, I think it's around 30 um, very small religious sects that were um, that received a similar treatment from the mid '80s up until I think the Branch Davidians, and they were doing this internationally too. There's a group called the Cult Awareness Network that put together a playbook in 1985 to tr- to take out um, and destroy religious sects. Who who put that together? The Cult Awareness Project. What Cult Awareness Network? Network. Yeah. Um, and the Cult Aware- Awareness Network w- was very involved with the whole, very, very heavily involved with the Branch Davidian issue raid and also very, very heavily involved with the FLDS raid. Was this um, a government group or wh- what is no. this? No. Now, this is a group that I actually still need to, to, if I could be an investigative reporter and find out more, because some of these people are still alive who were involved. Um, there was a man named Galen K- Kelly. And so... I'll just backtrack a little bit. The Cult Awareness Network was was created, um, I can't remember, in the 70s after the Jim Jones um, mass suicide, which just by the way, the Jim Jones himself was more communist than he was Christian. So just a little side note to that. Um, after that took place, and then there was, there was a big movement in, um, in the 60s and 70s of kind of radical there was the radical hippie movement and that was kind of intermixed with some radical religious movements where, you know, people were like young adults were like moving away from home and like they wouldn't talk to their families. And so the cult awareness network was doing forcible deprogrammings. Parents would pay them to go and forcibly kidnap their young adult kids and take them to a hotel and deprogram them. And, uh, but they started getting lawsuits um, and so by the mid eighties, they were not, not able to do the deprograms deprogrammings anymore. So then they came up with this other playbook as far as what their, their purpose was. Um, all I can say is that the, from what I can tell, when the, some of the main people involved were far leftists, if I don't know that they were specifically communist, I know that the, one of the women, she went to, um, Vassar college, graduated the same year as Jane Fonda she probably was indoctrinated with leftist anti-religious um, tendon, you know, ideologies there when she was in college. I don't know of any direct connection to communism with that. Um, I will say also with the, with the Branch Davidian um, issue that happened, you can look at the C-SPAN video footage of the, the trial that took place in Congress after the fact because the, the Department of um, 
or the Alcohol Tobacco Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, they, um, it was obvious that they made some big errors. And in that um, trial, not a trial, hearing in Congress, there were four um, senators in particular that were like guard dogs to be like, no, it was the Branch Davidians killed themselves. The Branch Davidians killed themselves when there was all this other evidence that like, mm, there's some other stuff going on here. And the four senators, and this is where I think the, the government was really wanting to capitalize on this or elements within the government. It was the four senators that were really hardcore, like, no, we cannot talk about anything that the government did bad to the Branch Davidians. It's only the Branch Davidians killed themselves. That was Joe Biden, who's on, I saw the video, I've seen the video. Uh, Orrin Hatch, um, John Conyers, and oh, I'm trying to remember who the fourth one was. Oh, Chuck Schumer. Yeah, those four. Wow, that's that's a really interesting <laughs> combination. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't use the word combination, or maybe I should. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that just kind of yeah. slipped in there. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that is really interesting. Yeah. Huh. And I, I will say also after the whole Branch Davidian thing that happened right after Bill Clinton was inaugurated for his first term, the day after you know, there was some 60, 70 men, women, and children burned to death that it, it looks as if they were killed by our government, the, the forensic evidence. Well, we don't know for sure because so much of the evidence just conveniently disappeared. But Bill Clinton comes out the next day and he's like, I'm so sorry that the Branch Davidians killed themselves. And uh, this is let this be a lesson to all of us not to associate and join any, any strange religious groups. So that was the big takeaway that Bill Clinton wanted the Americans to have. Yeah. So. Hmm. Okay. So you're doing this research. You're seeing the the parallels to what communist Soviet Union tactics were here in America. At what point did you sort of step back or have the realization that like, oh my gosh, like communism has taken hold in America and... I need to study the constitution more or like at what point did you start to really dig in and try to be educated so that you had not only like the information about what was going on, but like then you had like the principles that you were studying and trying to understand. I mean, I, ever since, ever since studying Soviet history, in grad school, I really gained a much greater appreciation for America and for our freedoms. And um, I mean, as far as during the research for my book, when did, like how long, like it was a gradual realization piece by piece, including, cause I didn't, I, I wrote most of my book between 2009, 2011. And then I set it aside because I just, it felt like I couldn't finish it. There was something missing. so I. I set it aside again, and then I, I I pulled it out in 2021, the summer of 2021. I was like, okay, it's now or never to finish this book. And then I had to catch my book up to modern day. And even so, and I just published it just over a year ago. So in the in the January, February, March of 2022, when I was finishing writing my book, I had my most, I would say, intense realization of all of like how far gone we are, I'm sorry to say, um, it was yeah. pretty hardcore for me to realize that. Yeah. What are some of the things that like when you caught it up, uh, over the last decade, you know, as I look back, I know, um, common core in education. I know you've got, a, a quite a bit in your book about like John Dewey and the teachers unions and, uh, some of those things I've, uh, also been trying to expose during my education uh, era here, but like, at, what did you specifically try to catch up on during the last decade? Yeah, so the first one third of my book covers um, what happened in the Soviet Union. The last two thirds is what goes on, what has ha been happening in America. Um, well, I had to expand my chapter on um, <laughs> anti-religious propaganda and pro pro-socialist communist propaganda within education and media. I had to expand it to two chapters. Um, I found that the whole woke wokeism movement 
I mean, there's so much to unpack with that. You know, that was not a thing, you know, at least not a thing I had heard of in 2009, 2010, 11, when I was first writing the book. So I had to catch up on all of that. Um, grateful, very grateful for all of the work of James Lindsay, who has put out a vast amount of content on that very topic. And yeah, it was pretty horrifying to see. Um, not only that, but on my chapter on the infiltration of America's churches, the literal communist infiltration of America's churches, um, where I had left off, you know, like 12, you know, years ago or so was about roughly half of America's mainline Christians were infiltrated with communism. And now there's come to find out that by 2022, the evangelicals have been under heavy attack as well. And that I thought they were, you know, had been holdouts from this infiltration and now they're being subjected to it as well. And that was pretty horrifying for me. Yeah. So what, let's see, Let, let's talk about, um, I, I want to jump back and then we'll come back forward. In the mid late 2000s, around 2007 or 8, 9, somewhere in there, I I stumbled on an individual named Yuri Bezmenov. Yes. And I was at the time, I had found out I I'd been battling with uh the state office and our local school district on math issues for a few years and uh you know for those that are just watching and haven't aren't familiar with anything of what i'm talking about we actually had one of the largest school districts here in utah stop teaching the times tables and long division to children for years literally probably five years and i had numerous teachers tell me they would they had to shut their doors to teach the times tables to the kids because they knew that the kids needed those math facts to be successful with higher math, but they would get in trouble if they were caught teaching the times tables to third graders. So it was it was completely crazy. Well, we got better math standards in Utah in 2007, and I started looking around and I saw, I was like, well, if math was this messed up, <laughs> that you know our state standards could allow for something like that to happen, what's in our history standards and so i read the kindergarten through 12th grade standards and i as i was doing it i realized the word republic didn't even appear in the standards at all democracy was there five times and it said it, the closest they ever got to to mentioning republic was one standard that said contrast our form of government with and it listed off a few options like democracy and others and i was like okay so they're acknowledging that we're not a democracy here, but they're not saying what it is. Like, we want to be really careful tiptoeing around this or something. And so, anyway, I I uh, started to get involved on that issue for uh, two or three years. And I came across Yuri Bezmenov, who was a former KGB defector to the West, and interviews that he did with a gentleman named Ed Griffin back in the 70s. And in 1985, actually. Was it 80s? Okay, yes. 85. And I guess when I looked at the interviews uh, in that era, it, it looked like 70s clothing probably. So anyway, uh, fascinating interviews. And I'm just curious, like, how did you come across Yuri in your research? And what what did you learn from him? Yeah, I came across that interview when I was first working on my book and it was, yeah, it was revelatory. I mean, and very interesting um, to see that this K former KGB agent, KGB propagandist, and he says that the, that the KGB's resources, you know, people think of espionage. He said, no, 80% of the KGB's resources are for propaganda and subversion, ideological subversion of um, people in different nations. And his job had been to be um, a propagandist in India. And he goes through all the details of how, because communism, kind of like Christianity, but it's like an inversion of Christianity, communism wants to spread throughout the entire world to enslave all humanity equally. And so they're not just comfortable with their nation. You know, the Soviets were not, you know, comfortable with it just being the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. They had to spread it, you know, all across the globe. 
And um, he goes through that whole process, very scientific process of ideological subversion. It's been very successful. And as of 1985, one third of the world's population lived in a Marxist, Leninist, communist nation um, under that enslavement. And we, we failed to realize that, you know, we, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, we kind of got comfortable because it kind of seemed like, oh, okay, it's a behemoth that's all going down. Now we don't have to worry about communism anymore. Well, there's still communism and it's still ticking. And Yuri Bizmenov warns us, a warning to the West in 1985 that we are very far gone, that the step one, which takes the longest of the ideological subversion was already completely overfulfilled in America. And um, that is demoralization. And that is teaching the children in the schools um, to accept socialism. Again, communism is socialism. It's just it's just the violent implementation of socialism. But Soviets considered themselves socialists. The USSR stands for Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So. Yeah. What my takeaway, I guess, when I watched that, and he was talking about demoralization, to me, uh, part of what he was talking about was not to demoralize someone in the sense of like, hey, I'm putting you down, but to actually remove morality from them. So it's like literally the demoralization of a society because when when people are immoral, he said you can present the truth with great clarity and they won't accept it because mm -hmm. it goes counter to what they've, uh, essentially they've given up standards once they're immoral. And, it's part and of it, like, yeah. And so the, there's, you can present that truth to them and it doesn't mean anything. It, it's like, yeah, I'm living my life, you know, go find somebody else to preach to. So um, anyway, that was, I think uh, that's probably one of the most important videos that's on YouTube, which is surprising. It's still there. Yeah, um, I agree. So, okay. So you've, you've done this research, you've gone back in, let's talk for a minute, let's jump forward again and talk about something that's relevant right now, like the woke movement. In what yeah. ways is the woke movement, in, as as you look at it, sort of a, a communist tool? It's not, not sort of, it is 100% Marxist. Um, so, this is where it can get, get confusing. So Marxism, you know, Karl, created by Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, um, he's a German philosopher in the 1800s. The Communist Manifesto is essentially a playbook for, for preparing a nation to fall to communism. And the playbook involves an oppress, oppressor class, an oppressed class and an oppressor class. And in the case of classic Marxism, which is what worked in Russia to create the Soviet Union, the oppressed class was called the proletariat. The poor people, the peasants, the poor workers, and of which, you know, the vast populace of Russia was primarily that group. The oppressor class in the, the case of, you know, Russia and that Karl Marx outlined, the bourgeois, the upper class, the middle class, people with money, educated. Um, you, you, what you do is you incite the oppressed class to go against the oppressor and to picket them and tear them down and eventually overthrow the oppressor class. And then when there's that, that vacuum of power, then the communists can come in and assume power. It's a playbook for power. It's essentially another way I like to look at Marxism. It's a parasite. It finds an oppressed group of people or a, a group of people that can be made to feel oppressed and it parasitizes them. It takes over their movement to use it for its own purposes. Um, and again, it's oppressed versus oppressor. So um, when, so, Karl Marx and the early communists, the Marxists believed that the whole world would fall to communism. They were surprised that after the Soviet Union, um, the establishment of the Soviet Union, they were surprised that it didn't just spread all through Europe and all over. And so those intellectuals um, got together and they kind of reworked Marxism into cultural Marxism. And they decided that in order to get the West, that the West was resistant for some reason. Um, and it was resistant to falling to communism because it had this moral hegemony, hegemony that was preventing it. And so what they had to do was they had to go in to that bulwark, that moral hegemony, the, those um, institutions that were keeping the West from falling to communism. And they had to infiltrate those institutions. And then so they could then prepare those nations to fall. Those five institutions are education, the legal system, the family, religion, and media. 
So uh, there began to be um, a very heavy infiltration of those institutions in America and the West, you know, and pretty early on, over a hundred years ago. And then we get to more modern days, like the seventies, then we have the critical theorists, the woke, what woke comes from, the neo-Marxists, where um, we have critical race theory developed, where the oppressed class is now black people, people of color, the oppressor class is whiteness, white supremacy, white people, and that's been retooled for um, queer Marxism, where the oppressed class is the LGBTQ, the oppressor class. This one is this one scares me. The oppressor class. It's not a. It's not even a group of people. It's the binary genders and heteronormativity, where it's normal to be heterosexual. That is the the oppressor. So that is what they are seeking to tear down, and they're doing it quite successfully in our schools and our culture, unfortunately. So and again, you can see some red flags of Marxism because anger. And, and envy and grievance and victimhood are the drumbeat that you hear. And, you know, tearing down the systems of power. And um, once you understand this playbook, um, you can't unsee it and it becomes more apparent, but otherwise it can seem quite confusing as to how um, some of this stuff is actually Marxist. Yeah, I agree. And the, the the battle that's taking place in the schools now for our kids mm -hmm. is, you know, I, a couple of 20 years ago, I didn't see any of this. You yeah. know, it, it just wasn't even on my radar as to that kind of level happening in our schools. And it was, it was actually during the math war period of time for me. I had a couple of parents say, uh, Hey, and these were at different schools. Uh, one of them was um, here in, in my school district and another was in a school district just north of us. Their kids came home from school and said, hey, uh, you know, communism isn't that bad. And it, their parents were like, what? <laughs> what just came out of your mouth? Like, how, how did you ever come to that conclusion? And they're like, well, we talked about it in school today. You know, and it's like, oh, well, let's time you know it's time to find out what you're really learning in school and yeah. it, it was a big shock to them and you know to me as i started to see what was going on in the schools it became more and more clear just like what you're talking about once you start to see what some of the problems are it's like it it's the tip of the iceberg is what you see first yeah. and then the deeper you go there's a lot more to it and yeah. And now, thank goodness that kids have cell phones in schools. I, I never used to think that, but now it's like they can capture when their teacher is saying something completely inappropriate and have proof that, no, the teacher actually said this. And we've seen that come out now several times, uh, even nationally, uh, make the news. So what what can, I mean, like for me, my my solution is get your kids out of public schools and either homeschool them or put them in some type of private school or something where you can trust and know the, the uh, content going on. But even then, you don't know if it's if it's in a classroom uh, setting, you know, what's going on. I, I just think that home, homeschooling is going to really, really take off. It's It's been growing so much, but like it's it's the only way to really protect your kids anymore. It, I, it's unfortunately true. And I'm homeschooling. I mean, I did, I have had my son in charter, a couple of charter schools at different times. My son is eight, mm -hmm. but um, I'm homeschooling him now again and plan on doing so indefinitely. I'm a single mom, by the way, and it's not easy to homeschool and work. Um, and I know there's a lot of people with a lot of difficult situations, but at this point, I'm really sorry to say, I don't think if, if we keep our kids in the school system, we are risking that our kids will be radicalized. So one of the, the most recent book by James Lindsay, it's called The Marxification of Education. And the whole that whole synopsis of what that book explains is it's not just that they're teaching quote unquote critical race theory in the schools. It's that they are framing the whole all of education in a Marxist way. So even like a math teacher. So by the way, dumbing the kids down was 
which is what you you know you noticed with the removal yeah. of the the obviously you can't not teach kids multiplication and division that's a deliberate dumbing down that is one of the 10 steps to subverting america's kids to, to communism that i talk about in my book um so besides just that dumbing down now you have math teachers they'll have and you can see it in the curricula too there's there'll be word problems okay mrs jones's classroom has eight girls six boys and five non-binary students blah 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 so just just mentioning and just bringing in those agendas in every which way um yep it's just a reinforcement then of course there is the the actually the overt indoctrination that goes on as well and what's called comprehensive sexuality education and um you know from what Natalie Klein has said, she's in the, I know you know who she is, the Utah State School Board, one of the ones fighting for our children. It's at this point now, Utah, it's upwards of 40% of Utah's high school students identify as an alternative sexual identity or gender. Upwards of 40%. Now, not 40% are not gay, but they identify as an alternative identity, gender identity or sexuality, which is part of the queer Marxist agenda. That's really frightening. Yeah, I ha actually had no idea it was that high. That's yeah. that's pretty stunning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's almost breathtaking uh, to to just comprehend that like four out of ten kids are that messed up. And what uh, I'll say, what I'll continue to say, is because they they're using cult brainwashing to get them because they're presenting to the children that you are part of the oppressor class if you are straight heterosexual and you are a normal gendered as they call cisgender which is a, whatever a normal gendered person who is a female who believes she's female and a male who believes that they're male if you are normal in that sense you're part of the oppressor class and if you happen to be white you're part of that oppressor class too so if you're white middle class one way that you can gain brownie points in this new marxist utopia they're creating is you can become an alternative sexuality you can become pansexual or whatever and say that you're you know that's what you are and then now you're part of the oppressed class and now you actually have higher status so, that makes that makes total sense everybody wants to have a feeling of belonging yeah and and that's that's why uh the whole equity diversity inclusion movement sounds so good on the outside exactly. when it's really toxic because yes. They say inclusion, but what they really mean is you're going to be excluded unless you conform. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so, yeah, what you're saying makes total sense. The, the kids, I mean, especially at a young impressionable age, they're not they're not set in their, I am not going to give in to this kind of peer pressure or this even authoritarian pressure coming down on me. Um, I'm going to resist. It's like, oh, well, where can I feel like I have a sense of belonging? It's really predatorship or pre pre predatory against yeah. these uh, students. Right. Uh, and, and one more aspect of this, one another way that people, children that are part or anyone that's part of the oppressor class can get can get out of that bad category is by becoming an ally, by becoming a a critical race theory ally. So you're an ally of African-Americans, which sounds great. I actually, I, I'm very much an ally of freedom for all people, regardless of race. I want all people to thrive. But in terms of the, become, you have to become an anti-racist, which means you have to, to be able to be an ally of, you know, an anti-racist ally. You have to try to go down and tear down whiteness. That's why you have kids pulling down statues of slave owners, you know, even if they were founding fathers, yeah. um, anyone who's tainted in any way. And then with the queer Marxism, you, you can become an LGBTQ ally, but that means then you have to go and actively tear down heteronormativity and cisgenderism and, and, you know, tear down those constructs. What will happen in our society if a majority of kids no longer believe, are no, no longer heterosexual and no longer believe in the normal genders? What happens? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, okay, end game. What... I mean, aside from parents, first of all, being aware and second, pulling their kids out to homeschool them, how do parents uh, deal with this and effectively help wake up people around them? Yeah, we, we've, we've got to, they've got to get educated. And I mean, that's why I wrote my book. 
And I'm also in the process of making a documentary based on this content. We're actually fundraising for it right now. Um, we, we have to educate people as to these agendas so they can see them. You can't unsee it once you see it. Um, I, I call like the, the indoctrination that the children are getting and also in the, in the pop culture, I call it putting on like woke goggles. And wokeism, it wants you to see only um, through power dynamics, oppressed versus oppressor. And so everything becomes racist, everything becomes homophobic, everything becomes, you know, you're, you're an oppressor. And so we got to get these woke goggles off of our kids if they've already, you know, been indoctrinated in that. I do, I do have um, some home lessons I put together for parents to teach their teens about freedom. The first one of them is free. It's called Why Does Freedom Matter? The second one is um, the red flags of tyranny to give kind of like, you know, things like censorship and different different things that are red flags of tyranny. The third one is called the ideology of wokeism. It's a two-part lesson. Um, I have a friend who was, grew up in the Soviet Union. She lives in Salt Lake now and has lived in the States since the early 90s. But she is writing a book, some children's books actually, um, to educate children, for parents to share with their children in an age-appropriate way to kind of help them understand what communism was and is. Um, I mean, what I what I recommend that people do in my book is to take, you know, become educated and take this information to their school boards, to their their state legislators, especially. I mean, some of these states, you know, we see some states have banned critical race theory being taught in the schools. They're, you know, banned children not being allowed to attend the drag, the family friendly drag shows, which, by the way, right. that's a whole other topic. Um, which and we need that type of thing. And unfortunately, in Utah, our our state legislator wouldn't they would not pass a law to ban children from the drag shows. Um, but we can, one thing that, that I think is not going to work and is actually a trap is if people try to go out and protest, um, you know, pride events that are coming up next month, there's evidence that there's going to, they're going to, they really want to get some footage to uh, Christians protesting this so they can cast all Christians as Christian nationalists, white extremist Christian nationalists. And, you know, we definitely don't want to do anything stupid, um, but becoming aware and protecting our children and trying to get these laws in our states passed. That, that's three of my ideas yeah. and solutions. Yeah, no, I, that's great. And I know there's a lot of work to do on this. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing time that we live in the history of the world. And yeah. I'm, I'm really grateful that you've done all this research. I'm sure, you know, you were inspired to do it so that there'd be another resource and a tool there for people to get educated and to try and understand, you know, exactly what to do. And yeah. so um, what is what is your website that uh, where you have those resources? Yeah, um, my website is beneathsheepsclothing.com. And um, from there, my book is for sale on Amazon and the link to it is on my website and my lessons are there. I'm also, um, if people will donate $15, the lessons you can get, get them for $15, get all three of them, or you can donate $15 to my documentary to being made and you'll get those lessons. And you'll also I'm really excited that I can actually going to be bringing James Lindsay to St. George in June, 2023. And we're going to be putting on a big event on, um, June 17th. First of all, I'm going to be interviewing him for my documentary, but then we're going to be doing an event on America's Marxist cultural revolution. And that will be live in person in St. George and also live streamed. And anyone who donates $15 to the documentary will be able to get access to that and they'll get those home lessons. And if anyone wants to donate hundred dollars or more to the documentary, might, they will get a signed copy of my book as well. Uh, awesome. And yeah, so well, that's great. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate you uh, doing this interview and, you know, we're going to try and push this and, and get people to help support the creation of that documentary. I think it's going to be a powerful tool and something that people can easily digest sitting down for however long it is and uh, be able to see it in front of them, see some yeah. of those things that have happened that we just don't get in the schools anymore. And uh, it's it's just not well known unless somebody takes the time to actually or has a tipping point where they're affected by something and then they are like, wait, what just happened? You know, I, I can't believe that just happened to my family. And right. then it becomes real to them 
and they they wake up and they have to go start hunting for like how did this even happen and uh and that's that's unfortunately the usual way people find out about these things thankfully in, in your instance you know you just started to get led down this this road to discover these things and so um we're i'm just grateful that you did so uh thank you very much thank you so much for having me on your show i appreciate it absolutely